Hi everyone, today's video is not gonna be about me fishing or giving you tips. Today's video is about Lurtopia 2. Uh, I wanna say big thank you to the people who organized the event, it was great. And I wanna say thank you to Tom Hunt as well, who selected me to receive that book, which was signed by all the big names at Lurtopia 2. Uh, the rest of the video you're gonna be watching Tom Hunt giving you great advices about perch and pike fishing so guys enjoy it I've brought a variety of uh, rods and stuff I'll probably start off with um, just like sorry mate just an intro to me so I'm I'm almost exclusively an out and out tournament angler um, guys like this, he doesn't like little ones, he likes the big ones. I like the, so, big, I like the big bike. So um, I, I catch my fair share of biggish ones, but for me it's about, I'm always thinking about um, techniques, water temperatures, um, fish behaviour, whether they're pressured or whether they're fresh fish, all of that type of stuff in order to maximize my day um, especially if we're in a tournament situation so um yeah uh, I'll, I'll run through um i guess the best way i mean we're obviously so the water temperature at the moment is going to be about five and a half degrees 5.8 maybe so we're just coming out it would have bottomed out in january at probably about four ish degrees um and as it starts to warm up daylight gets a bit longer pike are going to start thinking about spawning soon um so really like understanding the species so if we talk about pike to start with understanding the species they're going to be in deep water where all the bait fish is during december coming into january january is an insanely hard month like five blanks in a row four days five uh, eight hour days so i had 40 hours of fishing without a pool and um I hate January, I might just go on holiday in January now. Uh, but now as we're coming out into February, they're starting to come up into the edges in certain um, in certain venues. And uh, I had a great day, I had 18 pike from the bank the other day in four foot of water. So I know they're coming up shallow already because the water temperature's come up. They're going to look to start feeding. They might be pretty aggressive now as well. Um, and then they're going to start spawning and you'll, you'll see them. You'll see them in the rushes and they'll start spawning. When that happens, I generally leave them alone, move on to perch because perch aren't going to be spawning until March, April sort of time. So they're going to be nice and fat at this time of year. But um, yeah, so I was just talking with AD there. AD's, I'm just learning a little bit about these baits at the moment and carrying on from a conversation that we just had there with AD was at this time of year when the water's really cold what are the best techniques now i love um jerk baits at this time of year for one reason you get to suspend them without moving the lure and that is absolutely critical at this time of year sometimes you can see it on the fish finders as well if anyone's got a, a live scope i've just got the hummingbird live um, you can watch those fish and they're super lethargic because all fish are cold water species which basically means they're cold blooded means they're the exact same temperature so they're, they're only four or five degrees at the moment we're 37 degrees they're four or five degrees it means their enzymes are very slow they might only feed once every two weeks so um you've got to be able to you might have a window where they're going to come up and be aggressive for like half an hour during the day but a lot of the time you want to be offering very slow baits and slow to the degree where it doesn't move and that is the type of bait that's absolutely perfect so there's a couple of different ways you can fish these types of baits um, you obviously get it out there this is a sinking version it comes in a suspending as well so again depending on the depth i might want to try and get it down a little bit and you've got two options you've got basically a straight wind and it's a bit a little bit tricky to see in this water but if people do come up towards the edge you've basically got a very very nice slow it doesn't actually look that impressive yeah, yeah. it just kind of wobbles from side to side you get like a slow <coughs> s-shaped curve um, that can be quite good but the best ones at this time of year suspending versions as ad was just saying and you plop it out there and you can give it one turn and it gives a flash and then it sits there and then you give another turn you can fish one cast for like five minutes all right but it's incredible how i just see so many people fishing too quick at this time of year 
um, and you've really got to slow it down, mostly dependent on the water temperature. Um, when we start getting up towards the spring, so the pike are going to spawn uh, and we're going to get like, um, you know, they'll, they'll be moving up shallow now. Once it gets seven, seven degrees, daylight and seven degrees is perfect for them to start spawning. They then lay low. April's generally not great, end of March and April. And the best pike fishing month, in my opinion, is going to be May, last two weeks in May. Oh my God, it's absolutely, if any of you don't do a huge amount of pike fishing, um, do a bit in May and you will it, will, it will change your mind. You've got to obviously pick the right venues because you get a lot of other anglers start coming out, there'll be a lot of carp anglers on places like this, but um, it's absolutely fantastic. They're, they're basically, the water temperature will be up to about eight, nine, 10 degrees at that stage. They will be looking to put weight and condition back on. They bite each other, they fight, they rough each other up in the, in the reeds, all that type of stuff. They, when they're spawning, they're not feeding at all. And then they do all their feeding back on again afterwards. They want to look to put condition back on and the last two weeks in May is absolutely just, it's just mega. Um, if anyone's got any questions, just uh i don't know what you guys are into just shout a question if it's anything to do with like tournament um tournament kind of style i mean i can get my i got my crankbaits here so again don't do a huge amount of crankbait fishing in the winter um mostly because they're they're such an aggressive bait my my number one rule for crankbaits in the winter is or crankbaits at any time the water temperature has to be on the up if it's on the down they're sensing it and they get, they don't want to be aggressive they tighten up quite a lot they don't want to feed when it's on the up that's when you want to fish crank so even if it is six degrees and we get a re that real stormy low pressure weather come through a little bit of rain mild nights water temperature creeps up a degree degree and a half that's when i'll get on the cranks in the winter other than that i rarely put them on because they're just never really the best bait um, <laughs> Very, very aggressive. I don't know what depth we've got here. I'll put a shallow one on. And, um, and the best thing about crankbaits is that they wallop them like there's no tomorrow. A lot of, I'm, I'm a big, I love power fishing. Any of the techniques where you get to put biggish baits on, fish quite quick. So if you look, it's all about the rod tip on this one. Look at the rod tip. You see the rod tip bouncing around, da, 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 and you feel it through the rod. Now imagine how much vibration is pumping out into the water there. Very, very good in murky water sometimes. Um, but for me, yes, they can come and find it if it's in murky water, but really it's, um, it's a method that is, I can catch on a crankbait in the warm water when no other will produce. Very, very few other baits will produce because I'm effectively forcing them onto the hook. There is a certain, there's a feeding response that you can catch with crankbaits. So you can, you can cast it out, you can be around feeding fish, you can, yeah, nice one. You know, using, using your sort of colors like these, bits of silver, a little bit of blue, um, maybe perch style patterns, that type of stuff if they're on a particular type of forage. But a real favorite for me, you can see how chewed up this one is. That's a pure reaction strike bait. I don't mind fishing that in six foot clear water. It's the most unnatural thing you're ever gonna do. But the one, one rule that you gotta do is you gotta put some pace on that lure. Because if you fish it slow and they come up and they have a look at it, no chance. You're looking for a reaction strike. All right, in warm water, 14, 15 degrees plus, fish it as fast as you can wind it. Um, and the brilliant bit about that is, fast as you can wind it, they come and hit it like there is no tomorrow. Um, so you'll get less bites, but everyone will be super, super aggressive. So I fish this on um, these types of baits. On, 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 but um, I like about 15 pound braid. When you're crankbait fishing, it puts a lot of miles onto your gear. So you, you don't want to go 10, 12 pound, 10 pound. It's just a bit too finessy. 
get a tiny nick in it, you're gonna lose baits on the cast, that type of stuff. Minimum about 15, but you've got to go high quality uh, braid. You want to go minimum eight strand. It's got to be tough, it's got to be smooth, uh, and it's worth spending money on. So 30, 40 pound on a spooler braid is absolutely critical, in my opinion, for crankbait fishing. Um, if you watch the, I'll keep the rod tip up, well, you can probably see it as well. I'll keep it running a little bit shallower, um, but watch the rod tip. This is, I'm in weed already. Um, I always fish my crankbaits as well on um, wire trace. Anytime I've got a treble on, um, I've always got a wire trace on. I keep it light. A lot of people say, you know, d does it matter with perch? The, the speed that I fish these at, they, mate, they don't get a time to see the hooks and virtually don't get time to see the bait, let alone the wire trace. Um, and yeah, if you've got the right method in the right position at the right time of year. Um, I had a really good year on crankbaits, not last year, the year before. Uh, I had 34 perch over three pound and probably about 90% of them were on cranks, all on wire trace. So a lot of people will say, oh, does it matter with wire traces and perch? Yeah, if you're fishing slow methods, then yeah, it does, because they've got longer time to inspect the lure. But if you're fishing quick methods like crankbaits, then no, it makes no difference. Um, so look at the rod tip. Can you see the vibrations that are coming out of that? I'll hit the deck there again. That is why a crankbait's so good in warm water. Their metabolism's up, they're willing to come up and smash a lure, they're really aggressive. When it's cold water like this, just imagine, I always imagine them like, that's how deep they run, right onto the deck. Um, does anyone, who, I, I get a lot of questions around crankbaits because I think they can be, they're quite difficult. You've got to get your whole system right. You've got to get your rod right, your braid right, your running depth right, all of that type of stuff. Do people fish crankbaits much here? Hard baits, build baits? I like baits, uh, hard baits, but minnows, not crankbaits. Longer style, yes. yeah. Do you fish them jerk bait style or uh, no, wobble style? Depends. Yeah, bit of a mixture. Sometimes uh, with twitch sis, sometimes yeah. very slowly you have to play the lure like a wounded fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let it sit, then move it few times again yeah so you're talking more kind of like more like a minnow style like that exactly. a little bit longer yeah. and slender yeah so um so guys i'll give you a quick rundown because it again this is quite you walk into a tackle shop it can be really really confusing for a lot of people sometimes you get hard build baits, right? That's what I would call a minnow jerk bait or a wobbler. So if you fished it on a straight wind, it's a wobbler. If you fish it on a jerk bait, then it's got a brilliant, it, you can basically be smacking, smacking the rod tip. So you fish it completely different to the other ones. So I would be like, bang, bang, catch up the, the slack. Bang, bang, catch up the slack. Bang, bang. And what that'll do is that'll make it dive off the center line. So it dives, dives, dives off the center line. A crankbait, so you, for anyone down the edge, you can see that there. If you, you can see the flash. And that is, that can be, you can get right up near the surface as well. And that flash is a completely different style of presentation to what I would call a crankbait. So again, a lot of this is just like defining the right baits and using them in the right time. Um, what's everyone, has anyone got any questions? Just fire out some questions if you've got any. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll move on to <laughs> slightly different style. Maybe some soft plastics, drop shotting, Carolina. Yeah, yeah, soft plastics, right? Let's move on to a bit of soft plastics. Tell you what we could do. We could. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about. I'm going to talk about soft plastics for a minute then. Um, but I'm also going to talk about. Uh, just a little bit different difference in rods. So for example, 
Uh, I've got two rods here. Um, so just a quick breakdown on rods. If you walk into a shop, there's a million different rods out there and it gets really confusing <coughs> sometimes. So a couple of general rules of thumb. You've got casting weight, you've got action, and you've got length, okay? They're the three that you need to learn. Casting weight is obviously gonna be dependent. So you've got like ultra light, it's gonna be one to five, two to seven, two to 10. Anything below 10 are classed as ultra light. Then from 10 to about 30, you're kind of medium. Then from 30 above is like rivers starting to get into a little bit of pike and then exclusively for pike, I'd say is almost anything. Up Length should be, remember this, short rods for accuracy, long rods for distance. Short rods for accuracy, long rods for distance. That is why um, if you, like on a canal for example, you're only casting 12, 15 meters wide six foot six foot six six foot ten is more than enough yep. you can use slightly longer rods if you want to but for me go on canal small fish i like six or six foot six rods when you start moving up to lakes and stuff we've got a hell of an expanse of water here and i might want to be casting and covering a lot more distance i'm going to be looking at minimum seven foot seven foot six i might even move up and i've got an eight foot four rod there so this one here is seven foot six, 12 to 38 grams. And this one here is eight foot four, uh, seven to 28 grams. So roughly the same casting distance, casting weight. We're gonna 20, 20 ish to 30 ish grams. But this one's uh, seven foot six, this one's eight foot four. The extra lever, it doesn't sound like a lot, you know, it's only an extra, it's less than a foot. But the extra leverage of that 10 in, extra inches I can throw that lure probably another 20 yards on that rod compared to I could on this one. All right, so the length of the rod is really important as well. Um, and then obviously the action. I am a mega fan, so perch and zander fishing. You get small bites uh, that can be very delicate bites sometimes and you want to be able to hit that bite as fast as possible. You want a fast action rod. You want bits in the tip, See the tip moving, and then once I'm at about this ring or this ring here, I've got, like, see how this part of the rod all the way up here is not moving. That means it's got a hell of a lot of backbone. And that means when I strike, I've got a soft tip for sensitivity, but when I strike, I've got power setting the hook here. On a pike rod, you want the power setting the hook a little bit further down, because they, you've got trebles on the hook, they come up on it you actually want to give them an extra quarter of a second to get the bite get it in their mouth properly then set the hook so a slower action rod is generally better with pike fishing a faster action rod is generally better for perch and zander um, let's get a plastic on if you're going to go for a good all-rounder i'd say Seven, seven, eight, nine centimeters is going to be absolutely bang on. And select your weights dependent on the presentation that you want to get. So, for example, could be fishing 20 foot deep, but what if I want to force myself to fish really slow? I'm going to select five grams, seven grams in 20 foot of water. If I want to fish really fast, in shallow water i don't mind going up to 20 grams in six foot of water but that forces me then to fish fast as a general rule of thumb they say about one gram per foot so if you're on your shallow canals that are two three four foot somewhere between three and five grams is about right if you're on a slightly deeper lake up to 10 foot about 10 grams would be that's a general rule of thumb but you can mess around with your presentations um, in order to. So I've got seven and a half grams on here. I can, you know, it's an easy chuck there, whatever that is, 30 odd yards. Now watch the braid as well. Always go for high visibility braid. So if you guys do course fishing and stuff as well, float fishing, feeder fishing or whatever, you've got an indicator, you've got a float that you can watch. It tells you a lot about what's in the swim. Right, tells you when there's fish in the swim, when you're getting tiny indications if it's right. When you're on the feeder, same thing, you watch the tip, 
tells you when there's fish in, you get line bites. The only thing we've got in lure fishing is the braid, all right? So I generally go for a very, very high vis braid, orange or green, you'll see lime green on most of them. And I'm watching that braid like a hawk most of the time. Tells me when, the, when my jig's falling, when it gets to the bottom, I get a little dink and it goes slack. It's a bit tricky here because this is full of reeds. So um, I'm snagging the bottom quite a lot. But um, I can wind it up off the deck. And if you watch, when I, when I stop reeling, if you watch the rod tip, right, so we're falling, falling, falling. See it, see it go boop and then go slack. I know I've hit the deck there then. So I can give it another two turns, hit the deck. Another two turns, hit the deck. Another two turns hit the deck so I'm using that jig and that braid to read where my lure is in the water um, there's a famous saying as well that always remember what you were doing just before you get the bite it's there's loads and loads of different options there's you could be like oh my phone's just rung and then you get a bite you could be like oh, I think I've got some weed on you're winding in then you get a bite they will all tell you about what the fish want to do on the day. Um, did you get a bite ju just as it was falling after it came in? Maybe they're coming to the noise. Maybe they're up in the water. Did you get a bite when, sometimes I've had it before where I've put a rod down doing something else, picked it up and there's literally just one hanging on the end. You know, that's more like a dead sticking situation. Maybe a Ned rig or something that will be a prey fish style bait that will be stacked on the bottom. Always let the fish tell you exactly what you want for the day. Because, and they will, they'll tell you, keep swapping it out, keep changing colors. Then suddenly you'll get to a time when you'll get a few extra bites and that is really kind of like pulling the riddle of lure fishing together. Um, oh, it's got good action. Oh, there is a pike attack over there. There we go, right. Oh, uh, pressure. Oh, I've got wine. <laughs> There's a lot of fry there. I missed it. Yeah. I think so. It's surprising, aren't it? The stuff that's been chucked in there this morning. Any other questions at all? So that one there, seven yeah, foot six. It. So an easy lob for me there is 30 or 40 yards. Now I'm going to pick this rod up and get away with the same lure and the extra leverage is going to allow me to similar sort of action, fast action it's the Westin Power Tees so similar sort of action but you can, you can probably see the extra length there and it's so much easier for me to be able to fire that bait out with a longer rod. All right, instead of giving it a lob, you've just got it's, a rod is only an extension of your arm. So if you imagine, take, take it to the extremes. Like I said, short rods for accuracy. Imagine if you had a rod, you get these little ro ice rods for ice fishing hold in holes uh, that are like 12 inches, 18 inches long. Imagine the control you could put on a lure with a rod that's only just like that long. Loads of control, but you can't cast it more than about 10 yards. You can be more technical with shorter rods. Say again? You can be more technical with shorter rods. Exactly. More technical, more control of the lure, but shorter casting distance. The longer the rod, imagine this rod was 15 foot long. Like any of you guys sea fished with those big long, you know, uh, <laughs> beach caster rods. They're super long. You can't, even when you've got a fish on, you can't even feel what's on the end. Um, you know, but they are designed at throwing six, six uh, to ten ounces of lead. Um, a lot of dead dead reeds out there but, um, yeah so a you know a slightly longer rod is just going to be it's just so much easier to like to cast it i'm just not putting any effort into that and the rod's doing all the work um, So, what else? Are there any questions at all? Is your best way to present the lure with the reel or with the rod? Um, depends how lazy I'm feeling. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, so, certain methods I fish just on the reel. 
partly, okay. so especially if I'm perch and zander fishing, I like to try and keep the rod almost locked in here so that I'm just keeping it on the reel. Okay. I, get, I get my jig head right, so I've got the right presentation, the right fall. I use the right type of braid so everything's nice and direct. And I do that so that I'm minimizing the amount of slack that's in the setup. All okay. right? So if I'm casting a lure at you, I want to be just off center and that gives me the most amount of direct. If I'm right round like this, any bite is going to kind of get lost in the 90 degree angle. I'll get yeah. a little bit of a bite, but I won't get half as much as if I've got the same bite. So I tend to, perch and zander, I want to keep everything direct. If I'm working the lure, you see a lot of people jig and then you end up with a lot of slack in the line and sometimes you can lose a lot of the bite. So if it's a tough day, if it's cold water, Gemma and Xander in particular, I keep everything as direct as I can and I just keep it on the reel. Um, if it's summertime and I know I'm gonna be fishing a little bit more direct, I don't mind giving it some okay. because they have to come up and hit the lure a lot harder. So in the winter, you prefer to use mainly the reel? Most, yes, I take cold water keep it more on the reel yeah um, it's yeah because the bites can be absolutely pathetic at this time of year you know yep. if you if you ever I actually study a lot of like the underwater um, you can see stuff on water wolf footage there's a lot of you know where you can watch fish come up and they track a lure for a long time and they're investigating now imagine that's on a bait that's moving Imagine you're fishing a Ned rig or a crayfish or anything on the bottom where it's like pop pop. Yeah. And then you went one, two, three, four, five, pop pop, and you just creep it along the bottom. They got so long to look at it and they're so cold. I often imagine they're like, fucking slow it down, I'm shivering. And they like creep up to it and you move it and they're like, oh wait, and it's almost like you know, you have to you have to offer it so slow sometimes just because they're so not in the mood. And when they're not in the mood, it will just be the tiniest little pecks, you know. Um, so, yeah, definitely keeping everything direct um, is, is absolutely key. So on the Nedrick, what car, how many seconds pause you will recommend in the winter? Right. This is this is the true test of um, of how much patience you've got. OK, I fucking <laughs> hate fishing the Ned Rig and the drop shot. You have to fish it. It's a slow method. You can catch on it fishing a bit faster, but in general, it's a slowish method. If you can, I even do it sometimes, right, where I'm fishing the Ned Rig, so I'll, I'll cast it out and I'll be saying to myself, right, Tom, remember, remember, count to five or count to seven. And I'll get to like, and I'll go, right, okay, there we go. And I'll give it a quick tear and I'll go, one, two. And before I know it, my arm has moved the lure while my brain is still trying to count to seven, right? Um, because it's just, that's our natural tendency as lure anglers. We generally are getting bites when we're moving the lure, you know? So it is very difficult, but dead sticking can, can be absolutely, it's the same on a drop shot as well. A drop shot is the only method that you can fish a suspended um, soft bait off the bottom without moving the lure. So you can keep it, you can throw it out. Yeah, you can keep it in one deck. spot forever. You shake, shake the slack, you don't have to move it. Shake the slack again, you keep the lure in exactly. That's the benefit of a drop shot. Um, if you're fishing a jig head, you wind, it comes up, and then it moves on the way down. And it moves on the way up, moves on the way, it's always moving. You can't yeah, yeah. stop it suspended. That's why a drop shot can be really good when the water's cold. Um, but this is this is my favorite springtime bait. This is a chatterbait. Chatterbaits and crankbait. So again, a chatterbait, um, look at the rod tip. You get all of those vibrations coming through and it's, it's a blade, it's a metal blade at the front that shimmies side to side, um, lots of vibrations and again you've got to marry it up when those fish are going to be aggressive and feeding. So, um, yeah, fantastic. And the bites you get on these are brilliant. So you can fish soft, I kind of see these as, I think you can fish a trailer, so it's basically a little skirt like this with a blade on the front that goes brrr, and you can fish them with plastics on um, and I kind of like to put like little ball tees on. Can you fish them just as it is? You, yeah, you can fish them just as it is. I, I fish a trailer most of the time. More productive? More productive. 
Yeah. Yeah, I just it's got better profile. It's okay. A bigger profile. Like you've got the vibrations there anyway. You might like it's an aggressive method. There's not much visually to that. So I like to add a trailer so that you've got something to, you know, you've, you, you've got the vibrations. There's no point hiding it visually if you've got the aggressive vibrations there anyway. Um, you prefer to rig it with uh, paddle tail lures or? Right, well, we can do that now. So you've got a couple of different options. So we could rig a little paddle tail. So we've got Western Shad Tees on here. So you've basically got a bait fish kind of imitation, lots of vibrations fired out. The other trailer that I fish with them, so this is more of a pike bait that I've been experimenting with at the moment, is, um, is a crayfish trailer. The profile of this shaped bait to give me a presentation that I can't get with this. So that one comes through the water like that, all right? But it's, it's streamlined so it will sink quite quickly, yeah, because of the shape of the lure. The shape of this lure, instead of it being like that, it's like that. So it's basically like a parachute. And I want all of that profile of a flat creature bait. So this is a bait I will fish this deep in that much water when you get a little bit of springtime weeds and stuff coming up. And I want to pull it. Just to be above them. It, and it gives me extra time because it's such a slow fall. <laughs> lots and lots of profile remember when you're fishing up in the water as well the fish are always looking up so you want, that's a really good profile from underneath for a pike during the spring <laughs> even though i've got you can see this up near the surface it's quite a big bait when i pause <laughs> Even though it's got 10 grams on, it's still very, very slow. See how slow it's falling? It just holds it up there and gives it way longer time. All those big flappy arms. So yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you can use the shape of the bait. Not necessarily, I mean, that is essentially a crayfish. It's the creek or it's a crayfish imitator. But I'm using that up in the water for presentation rather than, and a lot of people say, oh, well, why is that? You know, you, you wouldn't expect a crayfish to be swimming near the surface. Yeah, well, you wouldn't expect, um, you wouldn't expect a bait fish to be that colored either. And you wouldn't expect, you know, something to be that colored. Or the shapes and sizes that we use in lure fishing are actually, it's the movement and the trigger and the, and the, the action and the vibration just as much as it is you know a lot of the time where you might be trying to imitate a perch for example so you put perch stripes on it but a lot of the time i mean you ever seen a fish that color no you can catch a lot of fish on really random colors so it's not always about you know a pike arguably you could catch a pike on a banana skin if you had the right if you had a blade on the front or a spinner or a whatever with it does that make sense so yeah. like it's just the movement and they just react to that movement a lot of the time so good um is there any more questions guys We've done about 40 minutes or so if there's any questions shout them out um the chatter, to me, the chatter chat. baits, do you use them in a slow straight retrieve? Do you use them close to the bottom? Do you let them drop on the bottom sometimes? Generally chatter baits, you can, I do fish them near the bottom sometimes, but they're an aggressive, I want that fish to come up in the water to come and get it. Okay. I want to get a good profile on it, it's got a good flash and it's an aggressive method. I, I want to be fishing it on the straight wind most of the time. Again. The vibrations that you get through the rod tip, I put occasional pauses in. If you look, look at the rod tip, see how the rod tip's bouncing around. That's, that's that blade, and I, I want that a lot. Um, yeah. You know, the more that that's, if, if I'm catching a lot, if I'm catching a lot on a chatterbait, when I'm on the pause, when the blade isn't working, that's the fish are telling me they don't want the blade. And I've got the wrong bait on, so I might as well swap across to maybe a But you know, sometimes flash and vibration attracts them. When you stop it, they 
come very close, sit, 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 and then take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of different scenarios and a lot of different, and that's the whole point. I always, I think of it, it's like a chess game. It's like a riddle. Yeah. You're constantly trying to figure out what the behavior is. And there's some days, we've all had red letter days, and they go absolutely nuts. And whatever you put on, you catch you won't catch it. And, the, yeah. and then other days, you get like one bite a day, or you blank, and they're, fair, and they're, they're just off. You know, figuring out, what style of day it is and then presenting the right type of bait so on very very difficult days i'm going to go much much smaller and much more natural as natural as possible aggressive days i want to be ringing the dinner bell what, what, what i call the ice cream truck <laughs> ding dong ding dong and where and they all come running out to, to want it you know lots of vibration lots of color lots of uh, profile big sizes that type of stuff so um Cool, thanks everyone. Uh, if anyone wants uh, any questions or anything as I'm packing up, I don't know who's on next, I think. Uh...